Freddie Blackett is the co-founder of Patch Plants, a London-based company that makes it easy for us city folk to choose, purchase, and keep alive our own urban garden. Since the company launched in April 2016, Patch Plants has hand-delivered plants and accessories to over 25,000 Londoners and helped keep them alive with free a free pa- plant parenting course and lots of plant care tips on their website and social media. Welcome <laughs> to the you. podcast. Thanks, Jess. Yeah, thanks for coming over. No worries. Um, I'm really excited to have you because, mm-hmm. well, I want to talk about, obviously, your business. and um, But first, I want to hear how you ended up in London. How I ended up in London. Okay, well, I think it's like a magnet, right? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah and God, especially yeah. for people who are brought up in and around, well, around the city. So I was brought up about 20 miles that way. So okay. that's southwest of where we are. Uh, in Surrey and uh, and it's like a commuter belt so my dad used to work in London every day and like a lot of young 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 lads I grew up to aspire you know I wanted to I aspire to grow up and be like my dad and uh, so I found it quite natural when I finished university to, to move to London. Okay where did you go to university? I went to university uh, in Edinburgh originally and I spent time in uh, Coimbra in Portugal. Oh cool. Which is one of the oldest universities in Europe and a beautiful city if you have ever a chance to visit it. Um, very small and not very well known, uh, which makes it even nicer. Uh, and I also spent some time in Argentina because I Spanish, I studied Spanish and Portuguese. Oh wow! Okay, that's really cool. Okay, so then you finished university. What year was that? Twenty ten. Okay, and then you moved here. And what happened? Did you get a job somewhere? Or yeah, so um, so I went and worked for an agency, a branding agency that my dad uh, set up or oh, cool. well, set up with my godfather. Uh, and you know, I just went there and I tried to interview for, for a job and they said no you're not quite right and I interviewed for another job there and they're like okay we'll give you an internship so I plugged away for three months as an intern and I think I had like one useful meeting with a senior person who who said yeah give this person a job and then and then thus began my career I suppose right. uh, which was great I, I really enjoyed working in in, in branding it's like historically it's about naming products uh, so like my dad came up with the name for Hobnobs, the biscuit, really, and wow. uh, like Ford Mondeo and Viagra, which is like his secret favorite. Really, name not product. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sorry, <Sci-fi>, that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sorry, Dad. Um, uh, and yeah, so that's where it started. But then it's it's become a lot more about brand management. You see it in the world a lot about you know managing a, a, a company's reputation in the world. Mm-hmm. So you get a lot of that, but also managing the entire experience that a customer gets. Uh, when they interact with the brand not mm-hmm. just the advertising but you know so I worked with Jamie Oliver in his restaurants and you know we were working on things like how we would present the menu and even what items we'd put on that menu and then how the staff would present the menu to, to the customer all of that now is how people perceive a brand especially in marketplaces which is so competitive yeah. so um so yeah I spent six years in total doing that uh, and then then I went off on, on my own and set up Patch. Okay yeah that... so um, can you recap how we met? Because you know this is called Londoners We've Met, and yeah. so it, it, if you can give the recap of how we met, which is sure. quite recent, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, so we um, we met on a panel uh, set up by a lovely lady called Camilla, uh, who works for a marketing agency in London called Leo Burnett, and we were talking about what was the topic? Uh, work life balance. Yeah, work life balance. Exactly, yeah. which is something that actually is like pretty central to my daily focus yeah definitely (laughs) well I know I kind of felt like um that you and uh Michelle also has a son doesn't she so I was like looking to you guys for help with work life I was like why am I on here because I can't (laughs) even imagine like what you guys have to deal with with work-life balance but yeah it was it was really interesting that was I mean not just saying that because we were both on it but it was a good it was a good morning panel I thought yeah I really enjoyed it I don't I don't actually think it's that different uh I was having a conversation with someone last week and they were saying uh he's a he's a dad and he's saying um there are you just you realize that there are only five things you can be great at and I think I agree with this I haven't really thought about it in great detail yet but like he was like I'm a dad I'm a husband I'm a dad twice, but that counts as one thing. I'm a dad, I'm a husband, I need to be good at work, and then I've got two other things. So, like, I can be a good friend, and then I can run and try and keep fit, and that's pretty much it. So I think it's like, when you have a kid, it's just, you just have to maybe, like, sacrifice something. So I used to to sing in a soul band. Really? uh, In a great bar called The Blues Kitchen in Camden and Shoreditch. 
and uh, and I just had to give that up. Oh no. Yeah. Okay. But maybe one day again. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That's so. I think everyone in London knows the Blues Kitchen, right? Like that's. It's pretty... a that is a great Thursday Friday night out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's I'm good quite fun. far from Camden, so I never really venture up that that way too much but i think there's another location there's one in brixton now that's it yeah okay i've been there once but not when there's the live music on but everyone yeah. said it's so good yeah it's a good night out yeah so can you tell me the story of how you thought of patch yeah um so i moved in with uh so i met this beautiful lady called clemmy and we spent two years her living in her flat and me living in my flat and then i moved into her flat in hammersmith which is lovely. It's just off the river in um, just by a really good restaurant called the, called the River Cafe, which if your budget stretches that far, I definitely recommend. Yeah. Uh, but it's not like a daily lunch spot, uh, sadly. Um, and we, I moved in there and it was like, it was her flat very much. So you could like, you, I, I obviously I already knew it, but it was like, you know, she had her like rose patterns, linen, like her family photos everywhere, her like Sandra Bullock DVDs. And it was just very clearly Clemmy's flat. And it wasn't like, you know, when you move in together with someone, you like, you can do the place together. And I didn't really have that opportunity. Mm. So the only space I saw, which I could felt I could do up was the balcony. And it was just a bit of a dumping ground at that point. Uh, and like Clemmy just wasn't, neither of us were really that interested in plants. So I thought, okay, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to have a crack at it. I'm sure it's a piece of cake. Right. And, uh, and I basically, I took off a Friday and a Monday of a long and created this long weekend and created this project, you know, Pinterest boarded a load of ideas and then went down to a local garden center, which is now has now reopened, but it was at the time had just shut. And they were just, he was just like, I can't, can't keep up these rents. It's ridiculous. Mm. You know, think about what land prices have done in central London. You know, people are swarming, as I kind of alluded to earlier. It's like a magnet. It's a black hole for, for great people to move to, you know, in search of better society, job, community. And so it just pushes up prices, property. And like, if you need a gar- if you're in a garden center, you need at least half an acre, really, to yeah. be able to deliver a good offering. And these guys just, just can't afford that. So, mm. uh, you know, the costs are, are enormous. So there was no really good garden center within walking distance. So I had to like lug myself to, uh, I won't name it, but like a very generic uh, outdoor store type thing in Wandsworth. Mm, and the one. offering, <laughs> yeah, the offering there is pretty rubbish. Uh, it's, and there's no one really there to advise you. And then you go, I was like, well, surely I can just go online. But everything online is targeted towards people who've got a load of experience in buying plants. Mm. You know, they measure their outdoor space in acres, not square feet. So... Uh, in the end, I was just like, what's going on? Why can I not do this? This should be so much easier. And I, and I bought a load of plants out of frustration uh, and spent a load of money on it and they died. Oh, they, I mean, literally, I put them in and they just started declining immediately because they were totally inappropriate for the space. For the space, okay. So I just thought, this experience sucks. You know, you go into it with so much excitement and you come out of it full of dejection, guilt. Like, if I can't look after a plant, how am I meant to look <laughs> after a dog or a child? Yeah, and plants, they're expensive. They they're, are, seriously expensive yeah. things. And yeah, and you obviously have to pay for, like, if they need food and water and stuff. So it's not something you want to just kind of... It's it. That's a, you, even worse if you've spent all this money and then yeah. now you're like, oh, well, that's gone. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so there's two ways of looking at it. If you If you spend a load of money and they die, then it's like, wow, that's the, the the biggest waste of money ever. But you can spend some money on plants and actually they are something that give and give and give. If you if you give them, they, they will give back. Yeah. Uh, and actually, when you, when you look at it, if you look at, say, plants for like a tall six, seven foot plant, which you might put in the corner of a room, and you compare that to, say, a standing lamp from a, you know, beautiful furniture brand, I don't know, from like Made, for example, actually there's you get some really good value for money there. But... Mm. You just have to make sure that you're choosing from the right ballpark, I suppose, okay. before before buying. And I definitely didn't. So I killed all these plants and I was just like, this sucks. So, But I just left it because I was like, I don't know anything about plants. So I, I couldn't do this, but someone will. And then like a year later, uh, I'd, I'd gathered a bit more experience and I'd still killed a few more plants, but I helped more survive. So like my net survival rate was positive. <laughs> And, uh, and I thought, I, maybe I can have a go at this. So I, I started playing around with the idea a bit. I spoke to a lot of people about it, about whether they uh, experienced the same problem. Uh, and I thought, yeah, go on then, I'll, I'll have a go. And I raised some, some venture capital investment, uh, which gave me, I suppose, the confidence, gave me a bit of a, gave me a stipend, gave me a little bit of kind of maintenance money. 
because uh, Camille and I were getting married that summer. Okay. Uh, no pressure. No okay. pressure. Exactly. It was like it was. It wasn't now or never. It was just like this is a really good time to do it. So. Mm. We did it, and that was April 16, and, uh, you know, we've had, definitely had bumps in the road since the beginning, but most of those have been learning curves, and we've applied those learnings really well. And, um, and yeah, we've, we've helped, I think, a load of Londoners get into plants, which is, mm. which is, which is a fun thing to do. 25,000 yeah. so far. That's yeah, that's crazy. That is crazy. When yeah. That, so when <clears> you <throat> first saw the idea and you, you realized that you needed funding I guess right yeah. so did the did you start anything before you went out to try to find funding or was it just an idea and you pitched it and then you were able to find some partners yeah it was more or less uh, just an idea so um, I met a, I went to something called startup weekend which is like a hackathon which is basically startup jargon for getting around a table and throwing around an idea and and you know it's, it's a very um, collaborative environment you get you're quite nervous about it. Lots of people are going around like asking people to sign like non-disclosure agreements because I've got this amazing idea. But actually, most people are enormously collaborative around ideas. Mm. And I got I met a lot of people who bolstered it really and challenged it, and then said, actually, why don't you look at that like this? I'm not expecting anything back, but that's just the the I suppose the ecosystem here. Maybe it is globally as well. Uh, but we, yeah, so I, I did this hackathon thing and then someone I met there was, uh, was an old friend of mine who worked in venture capital. Mm -hmm. So I had, I took him out for breakfast. Um, uh, like, like so many successful business meetings, uh, well, like the, the, the I suppose the, the basis for so many successful business meetings is a full English breakfast. <laughs> uh, and we, he then put me in touch with his colleagues. And I presented almost literally a piece of paper, which was, okay, it was like, there was a lot of thought that had gone into it. Right. And there was a lot of primary research that I'd run to see whether this was something that was worth doing. Uh, and um, and they agreed that it was. So yeah, it was, I mean, this is, they are quite a unique fund. They're called Forward Partners and they back a lot of great businesses, uh, places like Appear Here, which run oh, yeah. all those pop-up stores in London. Uh, they run a brilliant e-commerce business called Live Better With, which is run by a friend called Tamara, who helps people with cancer and actually now more broadly than that with lots of uh, diseases and uh, and conditions to live better with those conditions. Oh wow! Uh, so they 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 run a, and they rather they back a lot of a lot of great businesses. I hope we're one of them. Uh, and um, and yeah, and that and that's that's how we started. But then then it was, it's not a case of at that point going right. Let's now throw a load of money at the problem. It's Let's let's take eight weeks. Let's set some boundaries and mm -hmm. set some kind of milestones. Let's go and test this on a small scale. Okay. So we went to a we went to East Village in uh, in Stratford. So actually, the the proposition when it started was was quite based was based quite um, was based more on outdoor plants than indoor plants. Okay. So we targeted flats much like yours here, Jess, with like new build developments with quite kind of similar balcony shapes and sizes. Mm -hmm. And offering them a, a solution that would could turn something from like an empty space into an outdoor room. Okay. And so we did that, and we thought the best way to do that, to test that at a small scale, but really make the most of our resources, would be to, was to go to the Olympic Village. Mm -hmm. So it's now called the East Village, but it's where all the athletes stayed in 2012. So they've got 3,000 now flats. Right. Okay. Uh, and they're all within a you know half a mile radius. Uh, and so we put flyers underneath every single door and said, if this is interesting, give us a call and we'll give you a consultation mm -hmm. and then we'll recommend some, it was almost like a landscaping service at first, but it just proved that the problem was there, that people found it difficult to, that they didn't know what plants to buy, they didn't know where to get them. And then if they did get them, they'd have no idea how to look after them. Yeah. So that kind of proved that need and then it meant we could then spend a bit more money on, okay. on bringing it to life properly. So that test really worked out then? That was, yeah, it was really good. I mean, we, we got in a lot of trouble for Flying. essentially <laughs> breaking into these properties. <laughs> like we would ring a buzzer and say, we've got a delivery. And then we'd go in <laughs> oh with my God. You know, 150 flyers. But you just have to do that. You have to break rules because like people aren't going to take notice. You can't, you can't put adverts on Facebook when you're that size because yeah. it just, it, it's just so expensive. So yeah. Uh, we just had to do it and it's great it's, a, it's, it's something I'm very proud of and it's something we you know we have this kind of value in our business which is be scrappy and that's I think that comes from those 
very early days in the business. Yeah. Well, I think um, from my limited knowledge in startups, I've heard that the number one reason that startups fail is is cash flow. Yeah. And so I imagine that having, I guess it depends on how much money that you raise, but actually it could almost be a curse to have a, a lot of money because then you kind of just, you're not as scrappy and and being scrappy is going to make that money last longer, right? Mm-hmm. And is also just a really good um, culture, I think, to, to start a company with and to hopefully keep going with because being creative means that you might be able to be able to do bigger things with, with less, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's it, that's one of those like classic startup stories where you, it, the being scrappy is like the perfect the perfect description of it. Where you hear like this is where we started, and we just kind of like went back to basics, you know, got feet on the ground, and and ended up um, being able to go from there. So yeah. that's really interesting. So yeah, exactly. you did this you did this test. It went well, and then where did it go from there? So um, where did we go from there? So we we then thought right, okay, so it's worked in this Olympic village. So we, we think we've got an idea of like who our customer is. You know, the, these villages typically occupied by like, you know, first homeowners. So they're, and that, and that was really who we were thinking of targeting. It was quite similar to my profile when I moved in with Clemmy. It's like, mm-hmm. right, I'm now spending more of my disposable income on making my place look great so that I can invite my friends over rather than going out with my friends uh, and, you know, tearing it up somewhere. So, uh so we we then thought right i think we've got an idea i think we're pretty i think this hypothesis about who our customer is is right so let us take that out to this is like may time so this is still like bang in the middle of spring summer let's keep going with outdoor plants uh we just took it out to more and more of these developments around london and again we gained access to this uh this like online software portal which told us where all the new properties were and what mix was between things like social housing and private housing, how new it was, what the property values were, so we could get a good idea of whether there was a demographic fit. So then we hired some incredibly kind, generous interns to run around London with, you know, they basically carried my rucksack and they went out with so much energy in the morning with like 500 flyers in their back and then came back at the end of the day going, oh my God, Freddie, I'm so tired. Having just flyered, you know, uh, development after development. But that worked really well, like as a marketing channel, that was that is still our best marketing channel ever uh, because it's not something that people are used to. Like having something, it's naughty, so we can't do it at scale, but having something popped under their door is not something, that, that's not a common marketing channel. Like on Facebook, you're getting served so many ads. On Google, you're getting served so many ads. On mm. the Tube, you're getting so many, served so many ads. So it's difficult for brands to pop out. And so you have to try and find channels which people don't expect. Uh, and that's so often, you know, the most exciting campaigns have, have really used a very clever media strategy uh, without going into the technical details of it too much. But um, so we did that. We expanded into other uh, other areas of London. So we just kind of as like a pebble dropping into into water, just expanded out from Stratford. Uh, and then we got to the end of summer and realized that we had pretty good um, penetration, if you will, of London. We had a pretty good pre- presence across London for that demographic, new build developments, um, you know, young homeowners. Uh, we then thought, right, we're ca- coming into autumn, winter now. This is not going to be something that's viable. People don't are not really that interested in outdoor plants in, mm. in October, November time. Yeah. So now's a good time to, to launch our indoor plant range. And that has been like the best decision we've made because I don't think we were, if you look at all the data, Londoners, UK are not that excited. Like this is like historical data, which you'll find in boring market research reports. People aren't that interested apparently in indoor plants. So I was a little bit dubious about it. But, you know, again, we did our research. We spoke to people and uh, asked them, you know, just about what their needs were from like a furnishing perspective. Like, what about your home? And a lot of people in new build development said, well, often these flats are quite similar. And it's very difficult, especially if you're renting, you know, they often come furnished to put your own stamp on things. Mm -hmm. So pot plants, especially indoor plants, is a really nice way of doing that because I can carry them between house to house if we move quite regularly. So so we did it and we had a crack at it and we we, uh, found a beautiful flat, which was a friend of mine from school, which we shot all the plants in. We still use this great photography. And uh, and yeah, it's uh, we we gave them all the plants silly names as well, which was a huge success because, you know, if I said to you, 
would you like a Howie or Forsteriana or would you like a Big Ken? Uh, or even if I asked you to repeat what that first one was, yeah. I, I think you might struggle. So we just, again, we're just applying that kind of like, it sounds a bit cringe, but like rule breaking attitude to gardening. Like we're trying to, in large inverted commas, disrupt and transform what is a very offline, very traditional industry. Yeah. And we're trying to do it in a way that no one has done before. And it ruffles a lot of feather, feathers, but uh, equally it makes a lot of people, I think, quite happy. What does that mean? It's ruffled a lot of feathers. There's, you know, there's just a lot of people who uh, believe in the very traditional way of um, retailing plants. And I suppose that starts with, you know, uh, retailers should be the growers of plants. We don't grow our own plants. We don't hold our stock. We, we take plants from Holland on a daily basis, okay. um, which is great for the customer because they come from the best growing conditions overnight you get them fresher than any any way you could go if you went to a garden center a plant might have been there for four or five months uh but there is this theory that you know retailers should be growers uh that's you know we should be educating people properly around plants and that means um so i get it about like maintenance and making sure that people recognize what diseases are and being aware of you know nasty diseases uh plant diseases that is but uh, I don't feel the need to educate someone between, you know, um, I don't know, a um, what the Latin is for a pink geranium versus a white geranium. Yeah, okay. yeah, exactly. I don't, I don't think most people have that headspace and are, and are at this stage. Like most of our customers are not that interested in that. We're about ten percent of customers who are quite excited about really getting into the depths of gardening, and, and we are good for that. We are ready to to t- take them on that journey. But we are very much positioned at the beginning of someone's lifetime with plants. Uh, and that means being as accessible, accessible as possible. And there's just some people in the industry who want to keep it quite exclusive. My, my mom has always been really into plants ever since, uh, God, probably before I was born. And she's really good at gardening um, and picking flowers and taking care of them and stuff. And it's just never been of any interest to me. And any time I've ever looked at um, plants in like a garden center or... I guess online, well, not really online, but yeah, in a garden center, the the Latin name complete just, I'm like, nope, bye. Yeah, I can't, exactly. I cannot <laughs> deal with it. I'm like, that is just, I, I, I'll never remember that. Like, like you said, like, I'll never remember that. I don't know how to say it. So I, I love that the, on your site that they're called like Bob. And, yeah, 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 yeah. And like, how do you go about naming the plants? <laughs> Uh, so largely at random. I think I, nowadays we're doing quite fun things on Instagram. You know, we're inviting people to name our new plants, which is, oh my God, it gives me so much joy seeing people's suggestions. But um, at first it was like just random things. So you, there was something in the name of the plant, like uh, Laurus nobilis, which is a, a bay tree. We call her Laura, Laurus, Laurus, Laura. But then there are also things like, um, so there's one plant which is very popular, which is a great indoor plant if you're a beginner. <clears throat> so uh, in la- Latin name is a Sansevieria trifasciata, which uh, has a nickname. So a lot of these plants have amazing nicknames. And ha- this one has like four. Like one is St. George's sword, viper's bowstring hemp. But one of them is mother-in-law's tongue. And so I was like, okay, that's cool. I'll, I'll, name, I'll name this one after my mother-in-law. So she's called Susie. Or by my mother-in-law's called Susie. And, and we've named the plant Susie. But then my father-in-law was like, hey, where's my name? <laughs> So then I was like, okay, right. So then we got a new one called Almeria Maritima. And my, my father-in-law's called Tim, so Maritima. So we gave him Tim. But then my parents were like, well, come on. So it's like, <laughs> oh my goodness, like, you know, enough. No more, uh, no more naming for, for family's sake. So um, it's pretty random. But then there are some quite fun stories behind some of them. Yeah. Thanks for watching this mini episode. You can listen to the full episode plus my chats with other Londoners by listening to Londoners I've Met anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links are available on screen or in the description of this video.